Um, so again, thank you. Thanks for uh, this uh, this opportunity to to share with you about uh, first of all the upcoming uh, French shipment caravan. It's our 25th uh, caravan to Cuba. Uh, we refer to these as the U.S. Cuba French shipment caravans. And um, as Vic has mentioned, we've been organizing these caravans since uh, 1992. Uh, many of you, I know, know the history of how the caravans came about, but uh, it's always uh, great to remind our friends that um, we began organizing these caravans um, uh, actually uh, as an offshoot of some of the work that we did in Central America that we were just discussing um, in Nicaragua. Uh, back in 1988, um, IFCO was leading a delegation to uh, Nicaragua, and my father, Lucius Walker, Reverend Lucius Walker, was leading the delegation. Um, I was the, the co-leader. It was my first time in Nicaragua. It was completely green, um, and uh, it, taking it all in, a wonderful uh, trip uh, as we were traveling from Bluefields in the um, predominantly English-speaking uh, Creole uh, uh, black uh, community of Nicaragua back to Managua uh, on a uh, passenger ferry, uh, about 200 people on that passenger ferry that was attacked by the Contra along the Rio Escondido. And um, in that attack, as many of you know, there were um, several people uh, wounded, including uh, two people were killed and 29 people were wounded, and one of those was my dad. Um, we have always referred to him being shot in, euphemistically in the upper thigh, but um, <laughs> between you and I and the world, he was really shot in the behind. Uh, and um, it was uh, it was a good thing that he was well endowed, and um, you know that, that uh, there was no uh, uh, lasting lasting damage. But uh, in all seriousness, part of the um, and you know, de depending upon the way that your your your, your perspective, but the uh, uh, the divine uh, intervention uh, have it. Uh, there was a woman as everybody kind of hit the deck um, on top of each other. There was a woman's head who was kind of almost under my dad's pelvis, and she wound up being shot in the shoulder blade. The trajectory of the bullet, had it not hit him in his. Um, buttocks would have um, certainly hit her in her head. Um, so there are reasons for everything and um, uh, thankfully uh, uh, he was able to sustain and, and, and um, uh, recuperate from that injury and, and this woman uh, was not uh, more severely injured. But uh, this led to um, my dad being in a hospital bed uh, and saying uh, really praying for a, um, an appropriate response uh, to this act of terrorism that led to the creation of the Pastors for Peace project. Um, the, in the morning, literally, he announced, this is what we're gonna do. We're gonna organize these caravans as a way to not only take much needed humanitarian aid that was being denied the people of Nicaragua due to um, US policy toward that country at that time, but also as a way for the people of the United States to um, actively uh, speak out and act out against a policy that we felt was harmful and that we didn't want to see implemented in, in our name. And so that was the, that uh, counterattack was August 2nd, 1988, and the first caravan to Nicaragua uh, arrived in Managua on Christmas Eve of 1988. And it was, uh, it's interesting looking back because uh, the buses were a lot more rudimentary. The uh, caravanistas were kind of just this sort of motley crew, but um, but we made our way down with um, you know a, a small amount of humanitarian aid, several buses, and um, and uh, began organizing a what we refer to now as a uh, foreign an alternative foreign policy um, project, uh, a people to people foreign policy. Uh, project under the banner of Pastors for Peace. And so we were organizing those to Nicaragua when uh, a fellow by the name of Raul Suarez, who was a member of the Martin Luther King Center, he's a um, pastor emeritus of the um, Ebenezer Baptist Church in uh, Nicaragua, uh, but had been watching what we were doing and was uh, familiar uh, with my dad and approached him at one point and said, you know, what about 
organizing something similar for, for Cuba. And we knew that in order to organize a caravan to Cuba, that was going to take on a, a different, a slightly different approach. We had uh, an embargo, a blockade in place, um, which is Vic uh, rightfully mentioned has been tightened over the years. Um, there was the travel ban. There was, you know, the the uh, threat of um, ten years in jail, uh, twenty-five thousand um, uh, dollar uh, fine uh, that each of us could uh, receive. Um, it was going to be much more um, challenging. But um, any of you, and I don't know many of you who do knew my dad, know that he was the kind of guy who wasn't really daunted by um, those kinds of things, and just said, we, we ought to do this, you know, we ought to organize a caravan to Cuba, and a bunch of us were looking around saying, this guy is crazy, how are we going to do this, how are we going to make this happen? And um, <coughs> um, slowly but surely conceived of an effort to work with our Central American, our friends in the Central America Solidarity Movement, those who had been doing the work in Nicaragua and Guatemala and El Salvador and, um, and people of um, uh, progressive um, thinking who recognized that our, our government's policy in Central America could be transferred to, it was wrong, you know, the, the, that wrong-headed policy was also being implemented in, in Cuba. And, um, uh, so the idea came about to organize these different routes, these different stops, these different activities where we could work with our network of friends and supporters across the country who would uh, uh, support this kind of a, a program. And here we are 22 years later, and you all know that, that wonderful rich history. Um, we've taken tons and tons of aid in the form of uh, school buses and medical supplies and school supplies and and Bibles and bicycles and x-ray machines and you know and the like um, and much of that has come from from uh, Rochester and from communities like this across the country uh, we know that the aid that goes to Cuba is really uh, symbolic it's really a way for us here in the US to to speak out and act out against uh, a policy that our government has been implementing that's um, cruel and immoral barbaric and, and unjust uh, but it's been a wonderful symbolic <coughs> gesture and um, we are eternally grateful for the kinds of support that we've received from communities like this across the country and I raise that because there are a lot of people who wonder why 22 years later are we continuing to do this why do you keep doing this why? it's kind of old isn't it yeah and there's a couple reasons one is that our friends in Cuba continue to tell us that the significance of these <coughs> caravans are meetings like this, are um, opportunities to, to gather, to, to load um, you know, to, um, uh, medicines and, and supplies into vehicles because it's an opportunity to speak to people about Cuba. Uh, it's an opportunity to put Cuba on the agenda in communities across the country. This year, we will have, uh, we've got about 70 cities that are confirmed uh, along 10 different routes that's going from the West Coast to the East Coast. Um, we've got trucks and buses and uh, cars, personal vehicles that will be making their way um, across the country, stopping in different communities, holding uh, educational events like this, and um, putting Cuba on, on the radar talking about Cuba's commitment and its contribution in the area of health and education, um, gender rights, um, sustainable development, um, and, and more. Uh, but the things that Cuba offers the world that we never get a chance to hear about because of the information blockade. Um, I mean, in big and small ways, Cuba is just kind of isolated. Um, I don't know if you've ever noticed that when uh, there's a hurricane and you've got the <coughs> weather people showing the map of the region, and I've seen time and time again where Cuba is just not on the map. It just doesn't exist uh, in, their, in, in their reporting. Um, or if it's on the map, it's not referred to verbally. 
you can see the hurricane is heading straight toward Cuba and it's just, well, it'll make landfall in Miami on such and such a, a date. But it's just ignored. <laughs> um, so talking about Cuba, putting it on the map, putting it on people's agendas, putting it on the, you know, on the, uh, uh, and the minds and uh, on, the, on the tongue, it is a part of what the uh, the caravan does that's so significant and so important. And we're reminded of that by our Cuban friends um, time and time again. Um, because we have that conversation, does it make sense to keep doing this? Um, and they are convinced that, um, that, it, it, that it is. And I, and I think that there's, there's certainly something to be said about that. Um, we've been blessed with uh, uh, a project that really, um, there's a caravanista from uh, <laughs> the past. Last year. Last year, that's right. Hey. But um, we've really been blessed, uh, in short, with, short, with the opportunity to meet uh, many different people, to have uh, people from all walks of life uh, participate in the caravans, come and uh, <coughs> join us and bring their own flair, their own, um, uh, their own story, create their own story, and then return home to their own communities and share um, about that experience. So the other important aspect of the caravans is that it provides an opportunity for people to go to Cuba, witness it for themselves, and then return and, and be uh, ambassadors of, of peace and friendship and, and knowledge and, and, and a vehicle uh, that uh, breaks that information blockade because that's really uh, an important uh, aspect of the work. So it's been, um, it's been a wonderful uh, ride for 22 years. We are now organizing our 25th caravan <coughs> and the reason the numbers are off a little bit is because uh, We've been organizing the caravans to Cuba since 1992, but there were a couple of years where there were two caravans in the same year. Uh, there are some people who are considering that maybe that's something we ought to go back to. That's uh, <laughs> another uh, conversation maybe for another time. But, um, but we, we feel that this is an important act of solidarity that, that has not uh, run its course. and. Um, we're also very, very, very mindful of the fact that we couldn't do this without communities like uh, here in Rochester, right, Rockla, um, across the country. Uh, this is certainly not just a, an IFCO-driven um, uh, program or project. It's something that uh, really requires a, the support and the commitment of people across the country. But Gail mentioned something earlier. I was really struck by the fact that you were talking about, talking about the future of the organization. And how do we get people more, you know, a different demographic, <laughs> age demographic, kind of involved in, in our work? And that's, I think, the challenge that we face across the board. Um, as we've done these caravans, we certainly uh, been hear from people that we want the caravan to come through our community. But it's becoming more and more evident that we're, we're, we're facing a, a many challenges. One is an, an, uh, an aging network. One is uh, a decreased amount of sort of sponsored aid, which makes the ability for these vehicles to stop in city after city much more difficult financially because of the increased yeah. uh, cost of fuel. Um, the uh, uh, lack of uh, people who have the ability uh, to, to actually travel on the, the caravans. Um, so we've got to think creatively, because we don't think that the, idea, that the, the answer is to, to not do the project, but we've got to think creatively and boldly about how we continue to offer this uh, important um, solidarity, but within, uh, within our, our, our various means. And so that conversation is the important conversation that's got to take place, I think, in communities across the country. And, and we're hearing more and more about that. And, and also within IFCO, um, on the way up here, one of the great things about uh, the Amtrak and the uh, plugs that you, you know, have to keep my phone plugged in, and I was having a conversation with, um, some of you may know, uh, a driver by the name of Rick Fellows, who's, um, he's been a mechanic on the caravan since almost the very beginning. And we started having the, con he's out in uh, Seattle, Washington. but. Uh, but we've been having that conversation. What you know? 
wow, you know, we, it's important to continue this work, but how do we do this? And who do we network with? And how do we think creatively to um, uh, push this work forward, but within our means um, <coughs> in 2014? And how is that different? How, how is 2014 different than it was in 1992? So I think that it's a challenge that we all have to, you know, sort of um, uh, rise to. But, uh, but overall, the, the message that we've received as we've organized these 70 some odd cities for this year's caravan is that this is an important um, act of solidarity that we want to be a part of, that we want to see uh, continue. And, um, and people are, 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 are making it happen, uh, as you all are making it happen. And we're grateful, so grateful for that. So this year's caravan, the theme is um, celebrating the revolutionary youth of Cuba. There are many Cuban uh, young people, I always feel so old when I say that, yeah, young people, uh, who have never had to live under the Cuban dictatorship, have never had to go without health care or um, a free education or uh, um, access to health or access to housing. A lot of the gains that were um, accomplished you know, under the, uh, the Cuban revolution how do these young people maintain what has been fought for and earned um, based, you know, with, with the challenges that they face, um, not having had that personal experience and, and being bombarded in so many different ways, whether it be by technology or media or, you know, just sort of a, a capitalist world. Um, there's a lot of different challenges that are being kind of placed on these young people that um, we think is important to acknowledge uh, and to support them as they struggle through that, but uh, struggle to become, uh, to maintain that revolutionary fervor uh, that they, um, that they uh, possess. So that's the focus, that's the theme, and that's the, the plan for this year's caravan. And um, we're looking forward to um, bringing uh, people down to explore the different um, aspects, aspects of life in Cuba, uh, and again, so that they can return as ambassadors of, uh, of peace and friendship. And um, <coughs> we want to also take advantage of the changing um, attitudes toward Cuba, particularly within the Cuban American community. Many of you are aware of some of the changes that have been happening uh, down in Florida. Um, we've got a, a younger um, a Cuban American community that is very um, um, open and desirous of, of, of uh, improving relations with Cuba wanting to, to travel, uh, to, to be there, to, to go back and forth, to see um, improved relations between um, the, the government of the United States and the government of Cuba. So we want to be sure to continue to, you know, mm -hmm. reflect that changing mindset. Uh, we've got several people in uh, different communities in Cuba that want to send humanitarian aid um, and that are looking at holding educational events prior to the caravan, post-caravan, but want to continue to look at how do we keep sort of pushing the envelope and, and um, putting information out there to uh, not allow that sort of um, stereotypical uh, uh, Cuban-American uh, electorate that uh, we all sort of know in that stereotypical way. How do we avoid that being the image of, you know, what what Miami is, you know, what the, the mindset is uh, there because it, it is changing. So there's a lot happening. I think that there's still a lot of energy and um, hope for the work that we do, and um, and we hear that, and we want to make sure that that people are feeling that and feeling energized as we kind of move forward and look at um, how do we how do we continue to be supportive of our brothers and sisters in Cuba because it's important, they deserve that, we deserve it. Um, we know that the, it's not a one-way street, right? It's not just um, uh, what, uh, uh, what, what Cuba is receiving from us. It's certainly uh, very much what we uh, here in the, the U.S. and the mm. belly of the beast um, receive um, from Cuba, the example that Cuba offers on, on so many different levels. Uh, many of you uh, are aware of the medical advances that Cuba has made. Um, we're hopeful that one of the things we can do as part of the reverse challenge, which is typically a way to try to at least um, 
uh, as we're returning back to the U.S. from the, the caravan, to um, continue to push the envelope a little bit. And we want to talk about some of the medicines that Cuba has um, uh, pioneered um, in the area of uh, diabe diabetic foot ulcers. There are, there's a treatment uh, that they've um, really um, uh, cornered the market on um, to help really reverse the effects of these, uh, <coughs> this tremendous uh, ailment that's really prevalent in, in many communities. I know in the African American community, it's huge. Um, uh, we want to talk about some of the uh, treatment that they've got for vitiligo. Vitiligo, which is similar to, uh, the only th way I know how to explain it, Michael Jackson, the, the skin lightning sort of, um, and that people um, uh, are affected with. Um, there's um, uh, treatment, uh, there's various, various kinds of treatments, and, and so we want to talk about ways that we can lift that up and make sure that people are knowledgeable about the, the kinds of um, um, uh, efforts that Cuba is making on all of these fronts um, as an example of why we want to see the, the blockade uh, lifted and the, the, the actual benefits that, that uh, communities here in the United States uh, can, can receive as, as a result of that change policy. And of course, to uh, talk about the, the situation of the Cuban Five. Um, many of you may know that um, there's a campaign in Washington, D.C. that kicked off to today or yesterday. Um, five days, it's actually more like 11, I think, days, but five days for the Cuban Five. And um, this is an opportunity for people in uh, to visit Washington, to um, uh, lobby their members of Congress, to um, try to uh, focus attention on the plight of the these five Cuban um, uh, Cubans that were imprisoned and have been been serving long um, uh, prison sentences for really trying to focus attention on the fact that there has been efforts to. Uh, <coughs> organized terrorist plots in Cuba to, uh, to harm uh, people there, to blow up um, uh, public buildings, um, hotels, uh, and, and, and various other institutions. When these five uh, men had brought this, these, these efforts that were being organized here in the United States to the attention of the U.S. authorities, instead of the U.S. authorities, jailing the perpetrators who were organizing these events, they jailed these five Cubans who've been serving these long terms. And it's, uh, it's uh, an unconscionable uh, situation and it's important that we continue to fight for the release of the remaining three. And um, so it, again, an opportunity to focus attention on that effort. It's also part of um, what we hope to do and plan to do and, and uh, through the caravan organizing. So those are just some of the things that you know we're hoping to uh, highlight uh, in this year's caravan. Some of the, the reasons why we feel that this work continues to be important. Um, when I I was working at IFCO back in the uh, in the 80s and uh, uh, 90s and uh, left to go pursue my interest in my studies, which were in media and journalism, I was off doing my little journalism thing and. Uh, uh, when my father passed away, and Luis Barrios and I, Luis Barrios is the other co-director, and many of you know him, he has been here on numerous occasions, we got together and said, you know, is, um, is there still work to be done? Um, we knew that IFCO obviously had this great, rich history, and the question really remained uh, after my dad's death was, do we look at IFCO and just celebrate that rich legacy, that rich history, and um, say job well done, and bring closure to it. Um, as many nonprofits have, um, have done over the, the last uh, several years. Or is there still work to be done? And we determined after dialoguing with our friends and our network and the board and the staff that remained that there was still work to be done. And um, so that's what we're about doing now, trying to roll roll up our sleeves and, and, and continue to push that work forward. So the Cuba piece is one piece, the um, support of uh, grassroots domestic community organizing efforts across the country through our fiscal sponsorship work is uh, a, a certainly another um, aspect. And, uh, and we're looking to expand, you know, we're looking to, to increase the work that we've been doing. 
Real quickly, I want to just mention two other things. Um, many of you may be aware of the, uh, the medical school scholarships that, um, that are being offered in Cuba. Uh, IFCO has uh, been honored to be the entity in the U.S. to serve as the facilitator of uh, the scholarship uh, for U.S. applicants. And we just last, week before last, um, held orientation for the next round of uh, 10 young, wow. bright, beautiful students that uh, we hope to see go down. What we do at the end of orientation is determine, the orientation is really a, a little mini boot camp. It's kind of, <laughs> you know, we, make it, we try to make it a little rough along the edges, but you want, we want to make sure that, the, that these are young people that are committed to it's, it's, it's making sure that they have what it takes to not only practice, not only to study medicine and to learn those those ten words, doc, but you know, to uh, those 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 the new language that they need to to learn. But also, do they have the commitment to study medicine, do it in Cuba, do it in Spanish, seven years away from home, no laptops, no ticky ticky, you know, stuff, stuff, you know, a lot of that stuff that. <laughs> they've got access to here that they don't have there. Are they really of the mindset to be able to do this? And so that's part of what orientation is about. And um, we were pleased that um, all of them just uh, rose to the occasion. And so we recommended uh, these 10 uh, candidates to fill the 10 slots. Um, and of course, um, Elam, the Latin, uh, Latin America School of Medicine will make the final decision. Uh, but we're hoping that in the, uh, August, uh, the next round of 10 young bright, young uh, uh, people from the U.S. will be um, joining the, oh my gosh, the almost 200 other U.S. students in the, you know, in, in one year, one through six, that are already in, in, in school. There's about another, um, I believe it's uh, 20 graduates that will be graduating this summer. Um, there are some wonderful statistics coming out of this program. And um, uh, it's an honor to really uh, be able to, to, to see this, uh, this project continue. And um, um, we're hopeful that we at IFCO can continue to provide opportunities with your help um, for postgraduate support. Because it's one thing for them to go through the, the, the six, seven years of training, but then once they come out, they've got to take these rigorous um, step examinations they've got to have opportunities for observerships, they've got to have um, ways to, uh, raise the, to, to, to make money while they're, they're um, studying for these exams, which are, are costly, and then to, to make their way into residency. But, um, but step by step, they, they're doing it, and they're doing it in uh, the most incredible way. So I just always um, have to be able to, to, to share a little bit about that medical school scholarship program, because it's a tremendous gift that Cuba has given and um, that we are continuing to bear the fruit. I mean, when, our, when these young people return to underserved communities with <coughs> a commitment to, to serve, um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a beautiful uh, marriage. Uh, so that's, a, that's one thing I wanted to share. And lastly, many of you know that um, IFCO has been uh, facing um, uh, sort of an attack I guess, by the uh, Internal Revenue Service, IRS. Um, the IRS, uh, at essentially, um, after a two plus, a two, more than a two years of uh, auditing <coughs> our books, um, determined that, uh, the IRS auditor determined that uh, our tax exempt status should be revoked. Uh, the reason for the audit, the thing that triggered the audit, was um, IFCO's support of a project called Viva Palestina. Many of you may know that Viva Palestina was a, uh, the outfit that had taken a flotilla of humanitarian aid to the people, the beleaguered people of Gaza. And um, they needed a fiscal sponsor. And so they came to IFCO and they said, IFCO, would you, would you be that fiscal sponsor? And uh, there was no question that this was in sync, in line with IFCO, its commitment, its mission, and uh, we stepped up to do that. And as a result, there were two people in Congress who um, contacted Eric Holder, the Attorney General, the Secretary of Treasury, and um, 
Attorney General. The Attorney General. Sorry, Treasury and uh, I don't know why I'm blocking on the uh, I guess the sec yeah, Secretary of State, IRS. Anyway, that led to the um, IRS um, determining that they needed to audit our books. So we, it wasn't the first time that IFCO had been audited. We've actually come out with some of the highest uh, grades as a result of some of these audits. Uh, but this has been, as our attorney likes to refer to, a, a, a full colonoscopy. They have come <laughs> and they have gone through our books and they have just, uh, they've been, uh, um, they've been, it's been quite a challenge. After two years, more than two years, the IRS auditor um, determined that she wanted to recommend that our tax exempt status, our 501c3, be revoked. Um, we, what has happened since then is that we have this wonderful activist attorney by the name of, name of Marty Stoller. Some of you may know Marty is he's been involved with some of the supporting some of the uh, Occupy Sandy uh, folk, uh, um, Occupy Wall Street. <laughs> um, and, and various other um, uh, kinds of uh, cases. Wrote a wonderful appeal. Um, we've also since then uh, gotten the support of a, um, even at a, at, a, at a discount, a higher price to a law firm in, in uh, Washington, D.C. The importance of this law firm is that the head lawyer used to work for the IRS. So <laughs> He kind of knows the uh, the ins and outs. I wasn't sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing, but um, uh, after sitting with him on several occasions, he's really quite bright and he knows that language and he has kind of gotten, I think, the attention of the IRS in, in, in a way that's been beneficial for us. So um, the bottom line is that we had uh, two um, uh, uh, members of Congress who had pushed for the uh, IRS to investigate us. They were claiming that IFCO's support of Viva was a support of terrorism. The link that they made was that by supporting Viva, which was sending aid to allegedly Hamas, that we were supporting terrorism. There are so many problems with that, that Illo you know, illogical uh, trajectory, uh, never mind the fact that, that Hamas is a legitimately elected government of, of, of Gaza, but that's a whole other story. We'll be here all night, but the point is um, we, uh, we fought it, we continue to fight it. Right now the case is in the, uh, the appeals division of the IRS. They have the file. We continue to add uh, pieces of information to the file. The claim that the IRS auditor has made is that one, we supported Viva Palestina and supported terrorism. Two, that by doing the Cuba work, we were violating the, the, war, the, the law, the Cuba caravan. Three, that by um, taking little um, um, packages of money down to the, law, the uh, med school students who were legally studying, and studying under license, by the way, because they, they receive a license, uh, that somehow that was a violation. And four, that our support of groups like Jericho, that the various political prisoner um, groups that uh, IFCO has served as a fiscal sponsor for uh, is outside of our mission, that we are just didn't have any, I mean, I was reading through some of this in preparation, and it's always hard for me to even put this into the uh, language that makes any sense because it doesn't make sense. But there were a bunch of reasons that they've listed that we were, um, in violation of our, uh, our, our mission, and therefore um, our 501c3 should be revoked. Uh, we're fighting that, and we continue to say uh, boldly that um, this work that we've done on all of those fronts um, is not at all a violation of our mission, but very much in, in sync with who we've been and who we've always been and who we will continue to be. Uh, and. Um, so we're proud, we're proud of our staff, our, our support, our supporters, our network, our, our board of directors, um, that they've not backed down from um, this fight. And um, we thank you for continuing to, to stick with us. And we're feeling optimistic that, um, that um, right will um, uh, would prevail and make its way to the top. And uh, so that's what's been happening at IFCO. That's kind of where we are at this point. Um, 
we look forward to um, continuing to move forward, regardless of where things may even wind up, wind up with the audit uh, with the uh, IRS. We anticipate that um, we will uh, win that um, uh, that fight. But uh, regardless, we, we've made the commitment that we will continue the work, uh, no matter uh, what the, uh, the form. Um, Lou Walker was our founding director and brought us to this point, and um, um, I think that he would be proud that we're continuing to, to uh, push the work forward. Uh, I know many of you knew him. I know many of you um, have been involved in this fight from the very beginning, and I appreciate all that you've done and all that you continue to do and all that you will do as we move forward in uh, our collective uh, work to, to fight for justice. So thanks for being here and thanks for listening to me. <laughs> Reverend Lucius Walker, your father, used to make uh, another point, which I don't think you mentioned, but I'd love to know what you think of it now, because it might be something which would appeal to young people especially. But he, he spoke of this whole joining these caravans as a deliberate breaking of the U.S. law, and this was an opportunity. I mean, he, he feel, feel, felt, of course, that this was a very unjust U.S. law, and therefore we should break it. Right. And uh, uh, personally, I think it's, a, it, it's an easy way to do it because I, I was on one of, the, one of the caravans all the way to Cuba and back and, and he kept warning us about that and, and but at the same time urging us to go ahead and break the law and so we did. And uh, I, I, I think they make it easy because nobody, even though, as you said, every one of us that's part of one of these caravans could be given five years in prison or $10,000 fine. Uh, it, it's never happened that I know of, never in all these years, has there ever been even an attempt to uh, put some, any of us in jail or charges for a fine. So it's really sort of a safe way to, to do civil disobedience, <coughs> and this is real civil disobedience. Yes, and yeah. I, and I think it might appeal to a lot of people to just have a chance to do that. No, I think it's really important. I appreciate your, your mentioning that, Peter, because sometimes it's tough to figure out all the different aspects and, and to get everything covered, but that's a very, very important part of this, uh, this, this, this project. Um, the, it's always been about an intentional you know, expression of opposition to our government's policy as it relates, in this case, to Cuba. And uh, the government says that you can't um, technically, it's not that you can't travel to Cuba. Their argument is that you can't spend money. But uh, um, <laughs> often, <laughs> and they figure if you travel, you, you're spending money. But um, often, you, you've got uh, people at the uh, customs and immigration uh, desks that, that know very little about the law. You may know more often uh, as, as a traveler uh, that, than they do. Um, it's amazing the kinds of responses that I've gotten across the board. Um, you can't do that to, oh, um, some of you know Luis Barrios, and Luis Barrios, is, he works at uh, John Jay College of Criminal Justice, and um, he was stopped one time, and I, I was in hysterics because the, the customs guy said, well, I, you know, he didn't know what to do, and he's going back and forth, and Luis was just standing there, and the supervisor comes over, and he says, well, what did, you know, where, where does, who is he, who is this guy? Where does he work? Well, he works at the uh, John Jay uh, School of uh, College of Criminal Justice. Um, and they said, oh, well, he must know more. Then let him go. You know, he didn't go. I mean, just, it's arbitrary. It's just an arbitrary policy that they have in place. But, um, but the point is, um, it is uh, a way uh, for us to actively express our opposition. And uh, you have to be prepared to, to say, I want to, uh, uh, engage in, in um, nonviolent civil disobedience and that is very much at the root of the, the friendship and caravan and has been from uh, from the very beginning and you're right there's been no one who's ever been um, uh, fined or in prison uh, we often refer to and my dad used to refer to this all the time as a win-win situation if the government stops us we win because we have the opportunity to talk about the, the right. uh, you know the, this this unjust policy, um, if they don't stop us, we win because once again we've broken the blockade. 
And we've done that time and time and time again. Some of you may know from that very first car early uh, Cuba yeah, caravan, there was um, a bunch of us taking, uh, you know, medicines and, uh, oh, there was a, a priest with a collar on carrying a Bible in both hands. And there's this iconic picture. He's recently passed away, uh, but I'll never forget the, the image of Paul Mayer, uh, Reverend Paul Mayer, being kind of dragged by these, you know, these guys in uh, the, the uh, Border Patrol uniforms. And here's Paul with his, his, uh, his collar on, and he's, <laughs> he's holding on to these Bibles. And it was just this iconic picture. Really, you're stopping this man of the cloth from bringing Bibles to Cuba, you know, but, it's Cuba. but, um, but an incredible um, uh, illustration of the, the will of the people and, and the, the insanity of the policy. But you're right, that civil disobedience is a very key part of the project. Um, my question um, to you is um, regarding the fact that you switched from sending caravans to Nicarag from Nicaragua to Cuba. We have a sister city in Nicaragua, and after the, um, the elections in 1990 in Nicaragua, we made a conscious decision that we were going to continue that sister city relationship, and it continues to this day, because we figured that we already had a relationship with the people there. Right. Even though the government had changed, we still wanted to keep up that relationship. So I'm wondering what, what brought about the change in IFCO regarding um, stopping caravans to Nicaragua and starting them to Cuba? I think essentially it was really, um, there were a couple things uh, that were at play. I mean, part of it was the, the, the changing, um, eventually the changing uh, political climate in, in, in Nicaragua, which made it a little more difficult to organize the, the caravans in terms of their, <clears throat> in terms of some of the, the logistical issues related to bringing aid and in, um, into to Nicaragua so there, there was some of that change uh, some of it I think was also uh, reflective of uh, IFCO's abilities its its limitations on some of its its actual uh, <coughs> programmatic limitations on, on how much it could do programmatically um, prior to d doing some of the work in Central America we had done some work in uh, in Africa uh, so I think that there's always been sort of a, a shifting uh, sort of landscape and to some of that has been a result of not so much the commitment to the work but it, it, programmatically just what we could actually um, uh, sort of accomplish uh, with the uh, somewhat limited uh, resources. That's always been IFCO's uh, <laughs> uh, challenge. Yeah, thank you. I was trying to come up with a nice word, but yes, challenge. Um, and um, I think that there's often been at different times, you know, a desire to, to do more. There continues to be a desire to do more. And how do we do that? How do we do that and maintain a level of uh, control and authenticity and integrity um, in terms of funding? A lot of the funding, for good or better or worse, is, is really um, from, from communities like this. It's, it's direct mail appeals. It's grassroots uh, fundraising efforts. It's not so much. Um, uh, it's even limited uh, foundation support, and some of that is because of the, the progressive nature um, of, of the work. Um, so it's it's an important question, and I think that there's also you know we continue to be interested in going back and, and doing some work in whether it be in Chiapas or some of the, the communities where we've done this kind of work in the past, because it was, it was Nicaragua, it was El Salvador, Guatemala, uh, Chiapas. Um, so. How do we do that and expand to Haiti and do all the things that we think are important while also maintaining um, a focus on some of the domestic uh, organizing? But it's, it, it, it's, I mean, the reality is I think that to, to a certain extent, the changing political climate there and, and the, our, our programmatic uh, limitations uh, given uh, in some ways um, uh, those, those resources. But it didn't happen overnight. But there was sort of this morphing into doing a lot more uh, in Cuba, and, and some of it, like I said, was was uh, the, the political realities. Mm -hmm. Thank That's great that you were at that. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Like it was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> How are you, my friend? Yeah. How, How are, are you? <laughs> Good. Come on. <laughs> you coming on the caravan this year? I know. Fortunately, um, I, I want to say that. Um, 
So there, there's not only uh, sort of the, the way that we organize ourselves, it's not the only factor. Um, and I think uh, like organizations like IFCO, I was actually also on the Viva Palestina caravan back in 2009. Um, and I, I wanna say these organizations tend to internalize, uh, any activist organization I've ever been part of, mm -hmm. tend to internalize some very difficult objective conditions. So what we're talking about with the Cuban, Cuba embargo is a set of interests that were not as organized, not as, not as, um, not as large, not as influential, not as um, well financed. Um, and I think that the, the strength of the Cuba caravan has always been um, the way that you win people to, um, to, to uh, even knowing that Cuba is still an issue, you know, the embargo on Cuba is still an issue, is people who have actually experienced it, have been there in person uh, and, and can share those experiences. And I think that that's, that's, that's the leverage, that's the, that's, that's the most important thing. Um, but it's not, it's not easy terrain for any, any activist organization right now. The, 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 the conditions for any activist movement right now are not very good. Um, but there is very, very large ideological openings. Um, then, and I think uh, the way that we can sort of um, begin to, begin to uh, put a wedge in that is, is actually um, appealing to campuses and um, students. And they're, they're not necessarily gonna join Rockla. You know, they're not gonna come to the city and, and come to we meetings every week. But I think that there's an audience there. Um, we, uh, Vic and I were in Buffalo a couple weeks ago and um, there were students, a uh, group of six or seven students that were from yeah. Canisius College, yes. was it? Um, that, that, are, that are on their way. They're on a different project, they're licensed, uh, but very excited. And on their way to Cuba. Yeah, and they're yeah. actually doing research. Yeah, they're, 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 there to, they're there for six weeks. They're doing projects. Um, so I think that the campuses are really uh, sort of an untapped yeah. um, uh, place for, uh, for this sort of discussion. Um, <laughs> like the, the, the enthusiasms there, I would have loved to have heard about this program when I was when I was in college. I would have joined it immediately. Yeah. Um, there's an untapped resource there, um, but the, the, um, but I, th I think that yeah, we're d very difficult objective conditions uh, in this country. Um, and uh, like I wanted, the last thing, um, I think this this issue is really creating sort of a um, find myself agreeing with folks that are not our natural allies, you know, <laughs> uh, given the, the nature of the people that go on these caravans, you know, they're revolutionaries, uh, people who have been active in community activists for a very long time. And the Chamber of Commerce just wrote an open letter to Obama asking mm -hmm. for um, uh, an easing, like a, a 10 point, uh, maybe less, <laughs> a number of points, asking for specific um, addendums to the embargo to, Ch to, to ease commerce. the embargo. Mm -hmm. Chamber of it, Commerce, it, it open letter to only exportation. It wasn't importation. Yeah, right, right. It was only that they would buy <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. right, 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 right. <laughs> Travel restrictions, but um, I want to say that that's that's significant, mm -hmm. and um, that's this is what I this is this is what I mean when I say an ideological opening that people are open to considering. You know, th this is not working out. This hasn't yeah. been working out for decades. Yeah. Um, in the same way that they're considering yeah. other issues with. Uh, the American government, <laughs> um, that, that this is one of the major issues that, that can also be on the table. Um, and there was a broad range, range of interests among these students. Some of them were um, academics, they were, uh, some of them were uh, musicians, um, some of them were um, interested in medicine, studying anatomy. So like, there's, there's, a, there's a broad, like, but I think academia actually has that, that space. Um, so arranging for uh, people who have been on the caravan to speak at colleges, at Latin American studies um, departments, um, you know, like the, 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 the professors in these departments, I, I found a very, very um, receptive and yeah. welcoming to that, that sort of thing. Um, so that's, I mean, I think that's really, that's, that's really something concrete that can happen. No, I, I appreciate that. I think, I, I appreciate that. I think that, that that's, that's concrete and, and that's helpful. And, and what I was saying, I don't know if you were here earlier, but we were talking about the, the conversations that need to happen across our network, across the country about how do we shake this up? How do we do this differently? How do we you know, expand our network? How do we get uh, um, a younger demographic involved? And, and so you're right, and I think that taking it a step further that IFCO as you know, you know, maybe the glue that maybe brings some of this together um, has a responsibility this is the conversation that we've been having in the office to be better about following up with the caravanistas, people who've been on the caravans. How do we, how do we 
you know, parlay that experience into something beyond just that experience. Um, for, for the network overall, but for the relationship with the people who've been on the trip, and then um, for the caravanista, the, the person who's, who's actually had the experience to, uh, to you know, to, to help uh, encourage um, uh, participation, um, broader participation. So I think that that's, you're right, and, and it's, it's been a, a self-criticism um, that we've been doing at IFCO about, uh, we're, we're so busy running and, and, you know, that we've got to figure out how do we, how do we t connect with the people who actually had the experience so that we can expand our, our, our work overall. Um, the other thing, um, the first thing that you, yeah, that you mentioned, which was, I guess, uh, t connected to that, uh, the uh, connecting with, uh, with campuses is, 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 is critical, is important. One of the reasons that we, Organize these caravans, God bless us, in the middle of the summer, because um, that's just crazy. It's just insane. Um, and we get down there and we sweat. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not embarrassed to tell you that I am just a bit of puzzle. And so I don't know if you can relate to this, but <laughs> we were in, in, oh, private that's summer. why I had oh, private. That's why I had then to leave Santiago. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it's it's a challenge. You just have to embrace your sweat. But I digress. Um, uh, but part of the reason for doing the, the caravans in the summer is, is, is that it's an opportunity to get people while they're on, on break. Uh, but there are other, and we've been talking about other, you know, maybe spring break, or, but trying to find ways that we can keep um, our young academic uh, uh, community engaged and, and involved in this project. So I think that that's, that's an opening, you're right. And, and a place where we we've got to we've got we can and we've got to do better. Good point. But no more self criticism. No so more. Yeah. No more self criticism. <laughs> no more self criticism. Yeah. That was my first point. No self criticism. Uh, like it's very very difficult terrain, mm -hmm. and I think the self criticism can become like the point when like it not considering the barriers, you know. But self criticism, kind of like, you know, yeah, the, oh. I, I think there's too much of it. That's, oh, that was oh. my first point. There's too much of it. Okay. It's very right. difficult the objective conditions that we're dealing with. Okay. All right. There's too All much right. self criticism. Self -criticism. Self -criticism. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, one way to raise the uh, bar in challenging the embargo, I think, lies in what we take with us when we go to Cuba and what we bring back when we come back. Mm -hmm. I remember initially anything with a power cord uh, sort of threw the customs people into a tantrum. <laughs> uh, and eventually that was okay. And then when we took 394 personal computers down, or rather tried to, they seized all the computers because they thought the Cubans were going to build an atomic bomb or something. Right, right. And, uh, and then I recall uh, a few years later, we took uh, some solar panels and uh, solar uh, power apparatus right. to Cuba. Mm -hmm. So my question is, is IFCO planning to uh, raise the bar in some other way in terms of what we bring? And then again, what we bring back in terms of medicines, you already mentioned that, yeah. and, and or other things. It's challenging because I think you, you've done a great job at talking about you know hitting those high points. Uh, the, I don't know if you remember, but the earlier caravans uh, uh, with the power, power plug, it was a toaster. Yeah. Um, the customs folks said, you can take the toaster after we cut the, the cord. Oh. I mean, it's just like, really? Are you kidding me? Um, see, just, you know, how do they come up with this stuff? Um, so this then we could, we could take the, the toaster and then the computers and they, they've been a little, you know, um, um, less uh, aggressive about the computers. It's been difficult because each, we, we pushed the bar, and we pushed the bar, we pushed, so there's very little that they won't eventually let us take, with the exception, and this is the argument that, again, and, and you know, and, and that we've been internally having is, with the exception of computers, they limit the number of computers. So my argument is that I think that we've gotta figure out a way to bring as many computers as we can, and to be prepared to really not go to Cuba, not to feel that we're on a, We've, oh, we've got a, you know, we've got a plane to catch. Um, we could send those who want to go to Cuba to Cuba, but those who are p committed to really, uh, you know, being there at the border and, and, and holding on to, uh, to um, uh, 
uh, you know, hold, hold on so that we, we can actually bring the computers through. Um, and if the computers don't go, then, you know, that, at least that cadre, that group doesn't go. Um, because I don't want to see us get so far away from the actual <coughs> act of civil disobedience, which is, it's not really the, the material aid, but the, the, the symbolism of it. And um, we've got to make sure that we don't, we don't sort of lose that. But the flip side, which goes directly to what you're saying, Vic, is that we have raised the, the bar, raised the bar, and um, at first we couldn't bring certain things. Now we can bring them. You couldn't bring them. Now you can bring them. Okay? You know, so it's, it's complicated. And I think, I think they, they, meaning the government, learned their lesson, especially from that, uh, it was the second friend shipment where um, there was a, uh, uh, a CNN cameraman who was kind of filming the caravan. That was back, it was a huge caravan, 100 plus people. And we were carrying uh, boxes of aid across the, the border. And the CNN cameraman was um, um, jostled in the, you know, uh, and, or no, no, the CNN cameraman, I think he like, his camera, bumped into one of the customs officials. So they arrested him. And that was the best thing that could have happened because he got really ticked off. And the, ca the coverage was great, you know? <laughs> he was like one of us, you know? Um, but they realized how badly, I think the, the government really realized how badly uh, they looked. Many of you have seen that video, the little yellow school bus, and you saw some of these silly, you know, the, the officials just sort of stammering and talk. they didn't even know what to say. What I mean, we really were able, but they, they learned their lesson, so they don't give us those great opportunities like they did back then. But. <laughs>